media. Yes. Uh, yeah, they can do use dry clothes. Afrique Media. In recent times, geopolitical competition has been on the spotlight, especially among major global players, and uh, the African continent is not left out. Geopolitics plays a crucial role in shaping the African economy, affecting its growth, stability, and development. The continent's geographical location, rich natural resources, and strategic significance have made it a focal point for major global pairs. Geopolitics influences the African economy in areas like resource exploitation, trade and investment, foreign investment and aid, political stability and conflict, regional integration and cooperation, among others. With this, it depicts that it is a crucial moment indeed for Africa as the geopolitical dynamics in the global context is greatly influencing the African economy, both positively and negatively. So on today's compelling TV program, The Pan-African Debate, we want to dissect to what extent geopolitics is having a toll on the African economy and how African stakeholders can handle the pressure as Africa is now a key player in global geopolitics. This is the Pan-African Debate. You are most welcome. Hello to you, beautiful people of Africa. Thank you once more for trusting us this day as we are coming again to discuss issues of utmost importance affecting the African continent in uh, particular and on this uh, platform, the Pan-African debate. Today, we want to look at uh, the uh, dynamics of geopolitics and see to what extent these uh, geopolitical dynamics affect the economy of the African continent. Like we have underlined in our preamble, it is a, a tough moment and of course a moment that the African continent is undergoing much pre uh, pressure as we see uh, that uh, there has been a hike in uh, geopolitical competition among global pairs, among world pairs, and Africa is not left out. What are the effects of what is happening on the African economy? What is the course of geopolitics uh, in Africa? And of course, what are the uh, dynamics that uh, actually inculcate all of the happenings around Africa and how will this affect our political stakeholders and even the uh, uh, economies across Africa and that is what we are talking about does they looking at the role of uh, or the influence of Joe politics on African economy. It's a pan-African debate. It is an informative as well as interactive program. And we're going to be together for two hours to discuss uh, this very important uh, program. And to do that with me, I have uh, this panel of experts uh, joining this day to analyze, critically analyze, uh, the uh, impact of the influence of geopolitical competition of the gamer among global Purse and how it affects the African continent, which has actually uh, uh, been in the fore in recent times. Let's take you straight away to the United States of America. There we are meeting uh, Dr. Eric Eddy in his capacity as program officer at the Solidarity Center, Africa Department. Hello to you, Dr. Eddy. It's a pleasure having you this day as we continue to discuss issues affecting the continent Africa. Thank you, Clarissa. It's always a pleasure for me as well to be uh, on uh, this uh, show and panel. I just want to greet my uh, brother Elijah. 
in Noaku, uh, Professor uh, Nubong, and uh, of course, you know, we're all of our viewers, watchers, and listeners. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the uh, it's a pleasure to be here. The continent is in uh, flux and reflux, to use a big word in here, and uh, it is the right moment to actually uh, discuss and uh, bring some sort of enlightenment and learn from one another. Thank you. Thank you, too, for accepting uh, this uh, around the world today, uh, Dr. Eddie. Now, let's move to Canada. We're meeting Mr. Elijah Enoku, joining as a researcher with Leeds University on African development. Hello to you, sir. It's a pleasure having you this day on the Pan-African debate. Hello, Clarice, and uh, tell viewers all over the world. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here one more time to discuss critical issues that are affecting our beloved continent that has always been and uh, looking at uh, ideas on how we can move forward as a continent. Africa is one, and uh, wherever you're watching from, whether from South Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Cameroon, Nigeria, all over the world, Africa is one. Hopefully we can have a fruitful discussion and learn. And those who are listening to us, that's the most important. Those who are listening to us, those stakeholders that might gather some ideas on how we share together and put that into whatever agenda they have for Africa. So thanks for having me one more time. And I should thank you for respecting uh, this uh, appointment with Afric Media Television, uh, Mr. Elijah Inokur. And to South Africa, let's meet Professor Gabriel Nobong, who is joining us in his capacity as a political economist. Hello to you, Professor. A pleasure having you once more on the Pan-African Television. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Clarice. I'm glad to be back. It's been a while. Uh, and uh, I, I want to also thank and appreciate you and all the team at Africa Media for the work that you're doing to put the issues on the continent, of the continent on the table. Uh, good afternoon to your televiewers. Good afternoon to my fellow panelists. And I'm looking forward to our engagement indeed. I think it's a very interesting topic and I'm looking forward to our engagement. Thank you so much, Professor Gabela. Indeed, uh, it's been a long time, but we are glad to have you this day as we continue to analyze and give Africa's perspectives to what is happening in the global world. And our focus this day is on geopolitics. And of course, uh, with the narratives of the geopolitical competition uh, or dynamics across the global world and where Africa stands, we want to analyze how this will affect or is already affecting the economy of African countries. I will kick off with you, Professor Gabala, before actually looking at the areas where geopolitics or geopolitical dynamics have affected the economy of African countries. Let's understand the course of uh, geopolitics in uh, present day society. Well, I, I, I think that we, in, in very, uh, uh, basic terms are, are looking at the relationship between nations uh, and, and the extent to which uh, global shares of influence uh, sort of uh, affect domestic politics and, uh, 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 and, and relationship between domestic stakeholders and their interpretation of how they must engage with their various partners in very, in, in very broad terms. So, so within the, Africa, the context of our topic and the context of Africa, we have broad, broadly recognizable shares of influence uh, in different sex, sex segments and parts of the, of, the, of the continent that are more present than others. Uh, in Southern Africa, we, 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 we fall more within the, the more uh, non-aligned sphere that, is, uh, that has our big conversation is BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China. And uh, it, it's sort of the, the mainstay of the, the kind of foreign policy that South Africa is driving. And uh, a lot of the regions, a lot of countries in the region are looking to benefit from that, that uh, aspect of its, uh, of its geopolitics. Um, we know that as we go further up the continents, the influence in the, influence in the east is, is a little more, more diverse. Uh, I think there's a, there's a strong presence of, of China uh, much in, each, in East Africa and in, in countries in, in Botswana, in, in, in a bit of, uh, I think, Zambia, uh, in Tanzania, under Magufuli was a little bit more diverse. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, North Africa has a different sort of dynamics. You know, they, you have one segment of them that uh, are, are relating more to the Arab League and the, the Middle East countries. And you have the other segment of them that uh, fall under the European Union neighborhood policy. And then obviously in West and Central Africa, especially in Francophone West and Central Africa, there's a predominance of the of the French, uh, as, as we have seen it. So yeah, some, of the, some of the very present entities uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that influence the, ge the, the geopolitics of, of that region in terms of superpowers. But when you zoom on the continent and look at it in a very broad sense, you have the, the broad East and West divide, uh, and to a very increasing extent, the America versus China, and then the increasing creeping influence of, of Russia uh, when it comes to security questions and uh, political questions, uh, you have that broad divide on the continent. When it comes to economic questions, I think the players are a lot uh, much more diverse. And so the standard single influence is no longer really obtainable anywhere around the continent. I think each, each of the regions and each of the countries are having an increased diversity of partners. But for the fact that the contestation seems to be between East and West. Uh, when it comes to the economy, it seems to be between the European Union, the US, and China. That's where there seems to be some clashes. And when it comes to security questions, uh, I think at the moment on the continent, it's pretty much between France and Russia. So personally, I think it's already interesting times for Africa. Uh, but, but I would caution, as I think a lot of my partners would do, to say that it just always presents opportunity. It doesn't say much of any gains. There's nothing we can take to the, to, the, to the bank yet as such. But it just positions us in a place where I think, personal, this is my personal view, I think we are in a better position in 20... Unfortunately, we lost to Professor Gabla, but we'll be coming subsequently uh, to you. We're going to continue in the same perspective with you, Mr. Uh, Elijah Inaku, as uh, Professor Gabala was underlining, we we're actually analyzing the course of uh, the geopolitics in the present society and bringing in Africa's uh, perspective, and you heard from his analysis, highlighting uh, the uh, uh, the relationship between Africa and uh, major global uh, past in uh, this uh, uh, contemporary uh, society in the same light. You know, these major powers are engaging with Africa, and uh, can we analyze uh, uh, to what extent their engagement with the continent? Africa is changing dynamics, be it in the political sphere, the economic sphere, and uh, the, the social sphere, uh, among others. How are these, uh, their presence uh, in Africa bringing uh, changing dynamics across Africa? Uh, Clarice, thanks for having me one more time. Um, I apologize that I want to start on a negative note that I did not see geopolitics helping Africa. And I will explain exactly what I mean, so that stakeholders can listen and have some ideas on how do we move forward. Indeed. Right from the time of colonialism, geopolitics has played a negative role on the continent of Africa. If you look at the colonization and the eventual, you know, partition of Africa, it was done, it was geopolitical stratification that took place. And each party was trying to grab their own uh, share of the cake. And when they partitioned Africa, you will see that there was no recognition of the cultural heritage. There was no recognition of the tribal heritage. There was no recognition of the identity of Africans when Africa was partitioned, such a way that you are going to find lines that were countries where, you know, geo, uh, geographically speaking, across ethnic lines that do not respect African identities. That's why you're going to find African countries where you have, you know, if you go to Cameroon, for instance, you have Bulus in Gabon, you have Bulus in Cameroon. You go to Congo Kinshasa, you have Wutus in Democratic Republic of Congo, Wutus in Uganda, all around that region. And if you look at the conflict that is happening there right now, 
the fact that these geopolitical powers ignored the cultural and identity of Africans is breeding a lot of conflict on the continent of Africa. But today, as we speak, those conflicts are now coming up in different ways. So geopolitics has played a negative role on the continent of Africa. Now, on a positive side, has Africa ever taken advantage of geopolitical you know, positioning that seems to be happening on the continent? The answer is no. We have not taken advantage over the years. I'll explain exactly what I mean. If you look at you know, what was happening in the time of colonization, there was internal weaknesses within the African countries that contributed to the Europeans actually dividing Africa into parcel bits and pieces here and there. If you look at countries or a country like Ethiopia that did not go through that colonization, if you look at the internal strength that was existing within that country that helped them to fight and stand strong as one and they were not colonized, that is what Africa needs to be looking at as we discuss these issues on the continent of Africa. What is it that Africa needs to do to take advantage of the current geopolitical positioning that is happening in the world now? Thank God we don't have a hegemony of unipolar power in the world right now anymore. We have different powers coming into play. We have the United States coming. We have Russia coming. We have China coming. We have um, Asian countries like uh, uh, India coming. We have China. We have all these countries. The question that you know I'm going to be delving into today as my objective is, what is Africa doing to take advantage of these powers that are trying to strategize and, and have influence in the continent of Africa? Is Africa going to go through the same Berlin 1884 conference where they're going to you know, divide Africa into bits and pieces and this one takes its own path? Or is Africa going to sit on the table and say, no, this time around, we want a say on what's happening in Africa. It's our continent. It's our resources. It's our economy. It's our country. We want a say on what is happening. Or is Africa going to stand back and allow the same thing that happened in 1884? Go ahead. Because whether you are talking about resource exploitation, whether you are talking about proxy war on the continent of Africa, whether you are talking about foreign aid, whether you are talking about trade, some of the things that you mentioned, whether you are talking about diplomatic maneuvers, or you are talking about political stability on the continent of Africa, you talk about debt relief and all this financial vulnerability that Africa is exposed to. There is geopolitical positioning that is taking place. Is Africa ready to take its position and say, hey, guys, we own this continent. We need to have a say on the table on what happens in Africa. Or, or is Africa going to take a step back and say, oh, OK, we are a poor country, highly indebted. We are begging that our debts to, sh should be structured. We are begging that our debts should be relieved. We are begging that, you know, if you come to, re to, to, to exploit our resources, we just want that meager 10%, as long as you can give us 10% out of it. Is Africa ready for the new discussion? Is Africa ready to be on the table? Or is Africa still going to be standing back and let the continent to partition one more time? That is what interests me. And I hope as we go ahead, we're going to have a fruitful discussion on what is the way forward for Af Africa. I'll take my leave for now. Okay, thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Elijah. In our co of course, uh, at, the, at the end, uh, we want to see uh, the place of Africa or the role of African stakeholders, especially uh, political stakeholders and also uh, the uh, economies across Africa to see how uh, uh, with the changing dynamics like you mentioned uh, in your uh, insight, uh, Mr. Elijah Inoroku, the, the fact that uh, many countries are now engaging uh, with Africa and in Africa shows that it is an end to the unipolar system and of course gradually uh, welcoming the multipolar uh, world and how can Africa uh, 
make its uh, place uh, known or the voice of Africans known in uh, this uh, geopolitical uh, competition or the, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Professor Gabula underlined, the sphere of influence uh, that uh, nations, global powers are actually carving across the African continent. Coming now to you, uh, Dr. Eddie Eric, uh, we want to continue to understand uh, in greater uh, details of the uh, place of geopolitics and how uh, the African continent can bring in the, uh, its own narratives to make uh, a different. Now, in the preamble, we underlined the areas where this uh, uh, geopolitical influence is being felt, uh, and one of the such was uh, resource exploitation. So my question that I am directing to you at this particular moment, Dr. Eddy, is how those geopolitical competition between major uh, global powers impact resource exploitation in Africa. Uh, thank you, Clarice, and uh, thank you to my uh, co-panelists. Uh, they kind of uh, established some um, foundations in and here. The uh, first thing I want to do uh, before uh, diving into the question, you know, uh, per se, is to uh, make, uh, and I'm sure we all, all of us, you know, what do understand that when we talk about, you know, what geopolitics, it is not uh, necessarily to the detriment of the African continent because, you know, all of the nations of the world, all of the societies, you know, do have the geopolitics. Uh, Professor uh, Nubong, you know, were attempted, you know, were earlier to give us uh, some sort of a, an understanding. But when we talk about geopolitics, uh, Clarice, what I want our viewers and watchers, you know, what to take away from, uh, you know, uh, at the beginning is that, you know, what we are looking at uh, the uh, intersection between uh, geography and politics decision-making, distribution, and sharing of the resources that, you know, what we have. And to what extent, therefore, the geography. And then when we talk about geography, we are talking about human geography. We're talking about physical geography. We're talking about the sea. We're talking about the rivers. We're talking about uh, the uh, lanes that we have, how big they are, how small they are, how uh, fertile those lanes are for cultivation, what kind of products uh, can be grown in, in there? What kind of industries can be developed? You talked about the natural resources that um, uh, the continent, you know, uh, does have. And matter of fact, you know, what they, uh, I mean, it is known that the African continent is uh, the richest when it comes to uh, uh, natural resources. To what extent those things, you know, were determined? When we also look at the human geography in, in here. We are looking at populations. We are looking at cultures. We are looking at uh, uh, history. We are looking at uh, the uh, size of the population. Today, we are happy to say that, you know, in a few years, Nigeria, which is the most uh, populous state in, uh, in Africa, will be competing with a nation like India in terms of the size of the population. To what extent the size of uh, the population becomes uh, a, an element, uh, a crucial element, you know, uh, uh, that can weigh in the economy if we want to make that connection in there. Geopolitics is also about army. If uh, my uh, brother Elijah talks about, you know, what colonization, we all know that, you know, what colonization was not done uh, by uh, just uh, sitting around the table and then signing treaty with uh, the African population. No. Matter of fact, uh, Siri Lionel James tell us that, you know, what the only place in the world where colonization was uh, done peacefully was in the books that are written by the colonizers themselves. It means that, you know, the weapons were utilized until today, as we talk about this a major geopolitical, you know, influences. Uh, maybe you want to uh, close. Yes, uh, the uh, geopolitical influences in the world uh, today, and we talk about these superpowers, Clarice, we do understand that they are not superpowers simply because that they have large economy. But in addition to that, they are also nuclear weapon holders. Therefore, superpowers uh, armies in there. So when we look, therefore, at, uh, at the geopolitics, Clarice, we also wanted to look at immigration. Professor, uh, 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 not Professor, but you know, my brother Elijah mentioned something that I want to build on, is a colonization. What did colonization do? Colonization created some uh, uh, numbers of uh, states uh, today. And those states have become also elements of geopolitics uh, uh, in India. Therefore, 
as we look at all of those things, to what extent, you know, were the natural resources that, you know, were the continent has, their beauty and their uh, vast amount of lanes that we have are the things that, you know, were attracted the European colonizers way back, you know, at the end of the, uh, I mean, the middle of the 19th century, for instance. And what did we see? The partitioning of the land, not just for the sake of partitioning the land, but for the sake of controlling, number one, the people, number two, their natural resources, and number three, introducing some cultures that today determine the African economy. At the end of colonization, what happened? What happened is that Africa became their supplier of raw materials for the uh, European industries uh, in the world. It started the way back, you know, during the time of slavery. African people were taken from the continent to become a material that were sold either in England, in Europe, or in North America. In, the, in return, we have what? Uh, a sugar that was taken from the America in direction to uh, Europe and vice versa. How did we enter in, in there again? And how till today, uh, uh, what is the book? Walter Rodney tells us uh, in his uh, famous you know, uh, book, how slavery underdeveloped the African continent. So there is this connection in, in there. Africa's, you know, uh, 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 geopolitical, you know, uh, strength in terms of uh, the uh, diversity of its cultures, in terms of the power of what people call the melanin, has determined also how the continent became so attractive for people from all over the world, from North America, Europe first, and North America, and continuing uh, 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 today. I want to talk very quickly about uh, some of those things. Maybe, Clarice, we want to leave aside for now the natural resources, but let's talk about cocoa and coffee. These are products, again, that were introduced in Africa, geopolitical purposes, because colonization was a geopolitical competition at the time when Europe, according to Adubu Ahen and all of the historians, uh, Ali Mazrui and all of them, when Europe was competing for grandeur. But that grandeur included, number one, the possessions that you have outside of Europe, but also what those possessions are bringing to you, to your economy. The establishment of currencies, the entrance of the African countries into the uh, what we call today, what we have today as uh, the... Um, present day, I don't want to use the modern, but that would be confusing, but the present day currency system that we have, the colonies of uh, the French sphere entered into the French CFA. By the way, it was a way of introducing us in there. What is the connection between this and the state of our economies today? Have we been able since the 1960s at least to break that kind and regain possession of our geopolitical you know, realities? To what extent today? Right? The cocoa production, people should know, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana by themselves, you know, will produce 40% of the cocoa beans, you know, in the world annually. But guess what? When it comes to Cote d'Ivoire and even Ghana, it is only 6% of the year cocoa revenues that goes to the farmers, the main producers, out of $1 billion that, you know, what this yields annually. So here are the realities. Yes, there is a clear connection between this geopolitics that we define, which is not just the natural resources, which is not just the competition between the European powers or the superpowers, but which is also the ways in which the African leadership. And that's where uh, Brother Elijah is right. To what extent our leadership, our decision makers, our policy makers have been able to make us take advantage of all of these realities that we have, whether it is the geography, whether it is the geography, human geography, or physical geography. Who is exploiting our natural resources? Who is exploiting our rivers? Who is producing electricity for us? Who is uh, making decisions about how people can cross the different borders that we have, which we all know are porous borders, easier for goods to go from one country to another, but very difficult for people to crisscross. To what extent it is difficult to travel from Nigeria to Cameroon today? 
also elements of geopolitics. Because once goods are not able to uh, 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 transfer back and forth between the two countries, between Nigeria and Benin, between Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, between Cameroon and uh, uh, Nigeria, fighting over the Bakasi Island at some time, you know, uh, back uh, in history, all of those things again bring us to the question of how African policymakers are actually leading the continents to take advantage. One final point is uh, we talk about the African Continental Free Trade Agreements. Why is this a powerful thing that is coming up and that should come up? And if well managed, it will be to the advantage because if done, it will be the largest common market in the world with all of these millions of people that exist in Africa. Again, this is an indication of geopolitics that the African continent should take advantage of. So in resting on that first question, what I wanted to do was to give our viewers a clear understanding of what we call geopolitics, and then African countries have their own geopolitics as well. idea. Thank you uh, for the insight. Uh, coming back to you, Professor Nobong, uh, we're going to continue in the same light uh, uh, with uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Adi said as a political economist. And today, if we're looking at uh, uh, geopolitical dynamics and seeing the effect on the African economy, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Adi already underlined the African continental free trade area, which I was actually going to come to it uh, subsequently. Now, we are looking at Africa's drive for financial independence. And uh, earlier on, uh, one of you made mentioned of, of the uh, plurality of powers across the African continent. And of course, uh, there is already the quest uh, to bring about uh, the fall in Western hegemony and see how we can bring alternative financial systems or money that can help boost the economies of the world, especially the economies of the African uh, uh, countries. So the question is, uh, how can, uh, in indulging with the, the aspect of multilateralism and also the, uh, uh, the global the dynamics across the Africa, how can African stakeholders uh, make use or maximize uh, the advantages? You mentioned in your analysis of that uh, these powers, when they come, they present an advantage or opportunities for the continent Africa and uh, debates have been ongoing regarding Africa's financial independence with the hike in geopolitical competition and other stakeholders coming into play. So what do you think African stakeholders can do practically uh, to ensure that uh, there is a, a, a gradual shift uh, that will see the continent have a legal tender that will facilitate trade among nations and of course uh, bring about economic buoyancy and economic development across Africa? Okay, um, uh, thanks for that uh, uh, question, Clarice. I think it's such a, it's a very broad, very broad question. And I will try to tackle it from, I'll try to isolate one of, or two corridors uh, to focus my response on. Uh, let me start with the trade dimension. The trade dimension, like the previous speakers have spoken about, there's the element, uh, there's the one opportunity that's represented by the African Continental Free Trade Area. Uh, that uh, the classical argument is the creation of a, a, a large uh, a market that is supposed to uh, have opportunities both for people who are wanting to come and do business with Africa, as well as enhance uh, Africa's competitivity with respect to the rest of the world. That is a practical uh, 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 low-hanging fruit that is within the with, that is within the the, the, the decision-making power of the policymakers within Africa. To, to promote that, make sure that it happens. And uh, the, the, the challenges uh, with respect to that um, are known, are well known and well documented. There are issues related to institutional capacity, the issues related to political will to be able to put into place and implement uh, decisions that have been taken to place. And of course, there are the more soft uh, interacting issues that have to do with the capacity of infrastructure uh, that links this 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 uh, this Af various African African countries to enhance trade. Uh, during the last uh, French uh, Africa 
investment summit that uh, was convened by President Macron. I think President uh, Ramaphosa of South Africa, and I think uh, this Denise Sengesu of Congo, and I can't remember which other president put on the table the whole question of enhancing the energy uh, potential of the Inga Dam. So that's the infrastructure question and the release of infrastructure that release, um, that has potential to power industrialization and go up keep to Cairo. So those are the practical things that would put meaning to trade, uh, being able to create the kind of uh, uh, infrastructure uh, linkages, uh, 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 both in road and rail and energy that enhances trade, that says that the continents uh, and the countries of the continent are willing and they are ready to do business with whichever power that it is. Now, that, that the, the, the infrastructure question and the linkages that facilitate trade uh, can directly be linked to the question of financing. Um, and, and more the multipolarity of the world means that there are now a, a diversity of sources of financing for such products. So when, when, when African presidents were in the French finance summit, they put it back on the G7 and the G8 and all the uh, traditional financiers to say, this is a concrete project that would link our continents, that would enhance the growth and development of the continent to which you can put money. So European Investment Bank, Agence Française de Développement, KFW, all your traditional classical World Bank, African Development Bank that has a large shareholding of wind powers, you do have an opportunity to be able to finance infrastructure projects that promotes the integration of the continent, enhances its energy efficiency, and obviously creates conditions that are conducive for growth that would enable the, the continent to be able to take advantage of the continental free trade area. Practical issues. Within the same project, the multipolarity of the world then uh, practically means that if the classical to fin uh, traditional finance partners do not jump on such a project, the Chinas and the Russians uh, have that as an opportunity. And of course, when we talk of China, we talk of Russia, there are other power players, you know, within the middle that are also coming from, coming from coming very strongly. So Africa then, in terms of preparedness to take advantage of these advantages, has to be able to then uh, get this project to be bankable because uh, having worked in that space, most people would not come and do the 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 the, the low hanging foot uh, preparation project preparation for you. It's a question of doing your project preparation, documenting each of these projects, and uh, getting to the point of bankability, and then looking for the finan financier. And and I think that increasingly, I'm personally of the view that we are getting nearer to such a space where. By the time we come back from speaking with the traditional Western partners, if they don't take on such projects, we would have alternatives. And, and that is the beautiful thing about the space in which we find ourselves, that we can identify our priorities, document the priorities, show that they are bankable, and then we have a, a, a multiplicity of potential financiers that will come on the project. And increasing political freedom, increasing political liberties essentially means that the hands of African leaders progressively and into an increasing measure, and I don't think we are completely there yet, but we are now getting to a space where they would have the political liberty, free from certain geopolitical influences, to be able to strike deals with an increasing number of a diverse range of partners. And I think that's beautiful, and I think that we need to be able to do more of such deals uh, when it comes to the question of trade and, and, and financing. Uh, apart from that, um, I think that the one emphasis I want to lay, one thing I want to lay emphasis on uh, would be the human human capital development capabilities. So Africa, where it is, has a demographic demographic dividend. We have a young, growing population that is promising to be a very uh, a strong middle class. Now, every growing, prospering economy has the one characteristic of having a middle class that is educated, that spends. Uh, that drives the economy and becomes the backbone. And that middle class needs to be educated, it needs to be technically competent, and it also needs to be a generation. So I think that, that uh, uh, in terms of where the continent is sitting, um, that is a, a sleeping giant, a potential that has not been completely harnessed. Um, we do have capabilities at the moment scattered all across the diaspora. Our educational institutions and our science and research institutes do not yet demonstrate the kind of cutting edge advancement that it would take to sustain the kind of growth and development that we are aspiring for on the continent. It's not sufficient to have individual experts scattered in certain countries and scattered across in the diaspora, which I think Africa has an increasing significant number of those, um, including those of us sitting on this panel. 
that uh, it can source from from its diaspora but that capability needs to be nested in the continent we need to get to a point where sitting in cameroon sitting in nigeria sitting in kinshasa in pretoria across the continent we have research institutions in advanced technology in almost any field imaginable i would personally think first of all in the areas that are of a competitive advantage to us, which is natural resources, and then obviously taking advantage of the fourth industrial revolution to be in the forefront of technological advancement. Now, one of the things that is akin, accustomed to the development of human capital is that it is intensive in the usage of human capital. You need skills to develop skills. And a critical mass of that, those skills needs to be reattracted back onto the continent. Um, I do not know well, let me just say I do not know. I think when you compare our research institutes and compare the capabilities of our universities with respect to what obtains in Asia or in the West, we still have, in my personal, in my opinion, a very long way to go in terms of building that capacity. We have the warm bodies, we have the numbers, we have the willing people, we have we for, for the average and let me close with this point, Clarice. And now our educational systems and institutions produce very capable graduates. The proof of that is that whenever we leave high school or leave graduate or first or second degree, anywhere in the world where we go, we excel. We excel, we, we, we stop, we step in there and we are top of our class and we are, we are the best scientists and the best economists and you name it. Now, the question which most people often then want to ask themselves is, the professors that train us before sending us overseas are sitting at our universities back home. Why are they not able to harness all of that know-how to transform the domestic economy? So it speaks of the, there's, there's a disjunct, they said they're missing elements. Personally, I feel that the missing elements have to do with soft elements, soft issues of institution, institutional culture, and the emphasis on science and technology and the whole political uh, will to be able to invest in those areas. I think that our university systems in Cameroon, for example, are too politicized. They need to be depoliticized and people to be allowed just to do pure science. You know, let the political science department be political involved in the politics of the country, but let the engineering and the medical faculty just be allowed to do medicine. You know, let the plant science faculty just be allowed to do plant science and let government provide the resources for them to do cutting edge research without having to have uh, a certain X or a certain Y nominated as head of department because he's uh, con politically connected to A or B. And I think that that is, is breeding inefficiency in the system. So the capabilities, the capacity, the human capital question, I think it's, it's a huge aspect that I think the continent really needs to invest in if we hope to take advantage of the demographic dividends to prepare the continent and the council of the continents to take advantage of the opportunities that are opening up for us in the future. And by the way, that human capital development I'm talking about also becomes the critical political force that we would need to negotiate and engage with these geopolitical strategic actors. Because I can show, I can assure you that my brother, uh, Dr. Elijah and Dr. A.D., who is sitting there, if they are partners, if they sit across the table from any Canadian stakeholder wanting to do business in Cameroon for the sake of the argument, the confidence with which they would engage them, it's going to be far way more superior because these are their colleagues. These are the people whom they share corridors. They are sitting across the road and across the, 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 the corridor from these same people. So, so yes, investment in human capital, getting the skills and capabilities to come back and sit and to drive the development from our country and from the continent, I think it's it's one critical thing that we need to lay emphasis on. And let me let me stop on that so that uh, we can engage more on the subject from the rest of the the, the panelists. Uh, Gabila, uh, let's ride on uh, with you, uh, Mr. Elijah uh, Inoko, listening uh, to the, the analysis of Professor Gabila. Actually, uh, uh, we want to continue uh, with this other aspect. We are talking about uh, uh, another area, which is investment or foreign direct investment in Africa, another positive aspect of uh, geopolitics. Now, the question I am asking, because 
the end at the end of, of this uh, debate session we ensure uh, that of course uh, the discussions will go a long way uh, to affect even the decisions uh, making uh, uh, bodies in uh, across Africa so as to maximize the advantages uh, which we have seen a uh, colossal uh, advantages of uh, uh, geopolitical engagement of all of course or the engagement of many uh, global powers in Africa. So now, uh, uh, Mr. Elijah Enoko, let's look at the uh, uh, how ready African stakeholders are to actually uh, grasp the advantages uh, that will come with this investment and diversification of that we're actually asking for as far as uh, this uh, uh, international cooperation is gaining grounds. Huh? Because when we look at it critically, we also want to analyze data availability. How uh, are we uh, actually provided with the right data that we can see areas that uh, necessitate, uh, that can necessitate necessitate a diversification or how uh, are these uh, young people because when they talk about human capital development we want to focus more on uh, the vibrant young African population and how ready uh, aware or conversant are there with the changing dynamics and how ready are there to grasp these opportunities uh, that come as a result of uh, the geopolitical engagement or a hike in international relations between African states and other uh, world powers? That is a very important question and that question will help us have a discussion about the real issues that we want to talk about. Geopolitical influence on the continent of Africa. I want to make sure that we come back to what we, the core issue is. Geopolitical influence on the continent of Africa. And the question now ties in into how is Africa now benefiting on, of, on that influence? Or is Africa actually benefiting? Because if you look at it, Therese uh, and my colleagues on the panel, if you look at how geopolitics is playing on the continent of Africa and the influence that they're having, there are strategic areas that Africa needs to take advantage of. And geopolitics is what Africa has not really mastered so well. You asked a question before. Let's look at the resource, you know, the resources of the on the continent of Africa, because that is an area where we see geopolitics playing in broad delight in Africa. The resources of the of the of, on the continent of Africa. We see competing global powers, you know, regional actors that are backing different governments in Africa because of their own interest, and we see that that has led to long and prolonged conflicts on the continent of Africa. That's you know disrupting economic growth. The question is, how are the young people going to take advantage of the resources that exist in their countries? When you have geopolitical powers, geopolitical players that are coming in, backing rebel leaders, backing different people and creating conflict that has become like what they call in the continent of Africa, a cliche, uh, a resource curse. It's now becoming like a resource curse. You find a continent in Africa where resources have been discovered, gold has been discovered, oil and gas has been discovered. It doesn't take long that you're going to see a conflict emanating on the continent of Africa in that particular region. Why is it that? Geopolitics, geopolitical players coming to Africa, breeding conflict on the continent of Africa because they want to exploit resources. How will, why, why does Africa allow itself to be played around by these foreign powers? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. Because if you look about, you know, capital allocation, like you, like you asked, or foreign investment and partnership, we've seen that geopolitical players, when they come into Africa, they have a preference for one country to the other. They don't come and spread money all over Africa, or they don't come and engage just globally all over Africa like that. They go strategically. They go to countries that are resource rich, and they have a reason why they're doing that. Is the reason of, of, of the interest of Africa or their own interest. That's what we should be looking at. Because if you talk about human development, if you look at the United Nations Development Index, you look at the poorest countries in Africa, and you look at what is driving that poverty, you'll be shocked about the foreign actors that are acting in that same country. 
we can take case studies on a corridor there. You are in Cameroon. You look at Democratic, I mean, uh, 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 Central African Republic. You look at the war that is going on there, please. Let's, let's speak reality and look about things that are happening on the ground. Look at the war that is going on uh, in, in, in CRA. Look at the political actors that are acting in that continent. Look at how they are backing one rebel leader against the other on the continent of Africa. And we're allowing that to happen. Because if we do not understand how this geopolitical influence is happening on the continent of Africa, we can come out with lofty ideals or how we can take advantage of this and this. But if we do not understand how they are coming through the back door to ruin us, we will not stop the siphoning of resources of Africa. We will not do that. If you look at you know, my my colleague uh, Professor Gabila, uh, Nobila talk about you know engaging with uh, uh, international uh, donors, which is a noble idea, great, but how does Africa engage with them? When you have the Britain World institutions that are giving loans to the continent of Africa at ten mm -hmm. to sixteen percent. And then they're giving to Western powers at 0.5. If you look at the credit ratings of Canada and the United States, for example, they are on A++. But these geopolitical actors will go to Africa, cause chaos so, in Africa, I'm, cause I'm, war I'm, in Africa, I'm, and then at the end of the day, make Africa a C-. When they rate a C-, minus, and you go to get money, you're going to get a 10 to 16% interest rate. How do you expect these countries to develop when they are borrowing at those exorbitant rates and then the Western world is borrowing at 0.0, 0.1%? That is the geopolitics we are talking about here, Clarice, because if you want to engage with Africa with clean hands, they say he who comes to the table comes with, uh, with clean hands. If you want to engage Africa with, on a equal basis with clean hands, you must make sure that Africa is acting on a playing level field. If you disadvantage Africa, it doesn't matter that you're talking about World Bank loans, Britain with institution loans, IMF loans, and so on, but you are already disadvantaged. Africa is already working, uh, engaging with those partners at a disadvantaged rate. How do you expect Africa to, 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 to have a leg forward? Not only that, the whole world is talking about global, you know, environmental impact and so on and so forth. Look at the impact of geopolitics, even from an environmental perspective on the continent of Africa. We see, you know, uh, in Nigeria, there was, I think, almost 100 and something people died from a dam that collapsed. In Mozambique, people are dying of drought and so on. In all these countries, look at what the global political strateg uh, uh, strategies are doing on the continent of Africa. The recent World uh, Environment Forum that took place, when Africa was asking for money, in order to do mitigation or adaptation. What did they say? These are the people that are causing the problem in the world, but they go around trying to strategize their interests without looking at the common good of Africa. That's what Africa needs to look at. Are we ready to engage these people and call them out when they're causing chaos in Africa? My colleague talked about infrastructure development in Africa. That's great. You know, building of roads and railways and ports and all this to enhance connectivity and growth within the continent of Africa, but it raises concerns of environmental issues that these people cause in Africa. If you go to Nigeria, for example, give an example. If you see the chaos, the chaos that has been caused by Shell and all these other uh, 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 geopolitical partners that have decimated the whole of the Ogoni land. And when activists rise up, like Ken Serwewa and they want to speak, what happens? They are killed. So we must call a spade a spade on what is happening in Africa. These geopolitical powers do not come to Africa with good intentions. They come to Africa because they want to engage in Africa for their own benefits. Africa must be able to stand up and say enough is enough. This geopolitical rivalry that's happening on the continent of Africa, it must happen to the advantage of Africa. Like my colleague already mentioned, Africa must take advantage of the technology, economy, you know, you mentioned about the free trade uh, area in Africa. If you read uh, Business Insider, you see the commotion that happened in the Western Hemisphere when this was announced. That tells you that these people are afraid of the African free trade zone because everybody was, you know, there's commotion. What does it mean? When Africa comes out with the African free trade zone, does it mean that, you know, the United States is going to cancel all its engagement with Nigeria, South Africa, 
Cameroon, Congo, Kinshasa? Are we going to be dealing with one single African body right now? What about our trade agreements and so on? China was asking the same question. Russia was asking the same question. That tells you that these people come to Africa without good intention. And Africa must stand up and say, hey, this is a time that one engage at partners. This is what we are bringing to the table. And if you look at, you know, whether you're talking about technology or whatever part you're talking about, all the resources, you know, there was a discussion that we had on our fixed skills. And I mentioned, if you look at the natural resources that are going to propel the world in the next century and the next dispensation, Africa has more than 40% of those resources. Whether you talk about, the, I mean, uh, metals that we need to use for cell phones, uh, electric cars, whatever, you can name them. Africa has what it takes to drive the world. But is Africa benefiting from those resources? That is what we need to look at. And that's why African leaders who are listening to us need to take note and make sure that the continent of Africa does not become a geopolitical football that they are now playing left and right like they did in 1884. Africa needs to become a partner on the table. Mr. Elager uh, Enoko, listening to you critically, uh, we, we, we begin to say is that, of course, this debate is actually uh, meeting the objective of uh, uh, enlightening the African stakeholders, enlightening everybody to, to understand uh, how geopolitics function and how Africa being a major player uh, among these uh, global world pairs can take advantage of the dynamics across Africa in the contemporary society to change, of course, narratives in every sphere, be it economy, politics, social, like we already uh, mentioned, uh, and uh, we will uh, tell, uh, confirm uh, with you that uh, uh, the uh, for advocates of Pan-Africanism actually uh, uh, talked about Africa as one entity and of course uh, seeing the advantages that Africa can actually get if they trade as one body. Now uh, continuing the same debate with the same objective uh, Dr. A.D. Eric to understand the place of Africa and how they can take advantage of the geopolitics which we cannot actually avoid uh, in uh, uh, this globalized world. We now want to to analyze uh, the aspect of uh, uh, political stability in Africa and how uh, Africa heavily rely on uh, geopolitical interests of uh, external powers. Uh, let's look at what is happening, uh, taking the perspective of Mr. Elijah, who mentioned that some powers actually come to Africa and create chaos, discord among Africans to actually uh, meet their personal objectives. Now the question that we are uh, looking at this particular moment, because uh, in recent times we've been seeing, you know, debates around the U.S. trying to uh, stop some African leaders from attending the, the just uh, ended uh, uh, Russia-Africa summit, uh, which actually is an aspect of geopolitics where uh, partners or stakeholders come together to discuss on how they can benefit from each other. And then we see some countries advocating that this uh, particular nations in Africa shouldn't attend or shouldn't engage uh, with uh, this country. Now the question is, should Africa or uh, should African leaders be dictated on how to take such a decision or strategic decisions that have a long way to transform narratives across Africa? And of course, bringing us still to this question of political stability in Africa and how the geopolitical engagement can help in uh, uh, attaining this? The answer to that question is uh, simply, and I love simple answers sometimes when uh, uh, simple questions are thrown at you. It will be a uh, disaster, a tragedy for us to applaud African leaders uh, being dictated 
I think at uh, last week at a show, we uh, pinpointed the fact that, you know, when it comes to the Russia-Africa summit, the U.S.-Africa summit, the France-Africa summit, or even the uh, forum on uh, China and African cooperation, it is the one nation, one country that invites a multitude of Africans of the states uh, to uh, their place or wherever uh, the location is. And of course, the conversation goes this way. I think we took it, and even it is not just the Africans, but in uh, North America, even in France, among the French parliamentarians, for instance, you do have some of the, the MPs that denounced the fact that the French government was uh, actually engaging or interacting with the African leaders in the sense of uh, telling them who to do, uh, what to do, who to meet, who to talk to, who not to talk to. Uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa of, uh, of South Africa, here in the United States at one of his meetings with uh, US President Joe Biden, uh, did mention the fact that, you know, it is a kind of uh, uh, childish uh, for them to uh, be told uh, whether they should uh, interact with uh, Russia or uh, or not. And uh, this pushback from the uh, president of South Africa, one of the uh, largest and biggest and powerful nations we have in, uh, in Africa, was a very uh, uh, significant. We heard the same thing also from the president of Ghana, where during one of his encounters with uh, the president of uh, France, Macron, uh, and then on the many topics, sometimes uh, you do hear those African of states, you know, head of states reacting. So the uh, simple answer to that question, should they be dictated? The answer is again, uh, uh, no, uh, it isn't here uh, very clearly. And then the other question that you asked, the uh, aspects of, uh, uh, before I get into that, uh, Clarice, you talk about the change of narratives. One of the things that you know what I have heard and I am happy to be hearing anytime you have uh, taken the uh, floor to introduce a new uh, question or a situate where we are in the debate, you call Africa a major player in the world geopolitics or this uh, global world relation that we are uh, corresponding, uh... Professor Nubong, you want to close your mic, please? And uh, so, Clarice, I believe that, you know, well, those words that you use, calling Africa a uh, major player, I'm not sure that, you know, but we have uh, many, uh, let's say, Africans, uh, stakeholders, uh, members of a parliament, you know, uh, policymakers on the African continent that understand that this dimension of thing. Because geopolitics is also about language. Geopolitics is also about, you know, what well, the words that we use. Why do we call some nations, you know, well, superpowers? Others, we don't. Why do we call some nations, you know, uh, even when we use the word, you know, we're poor countries or poor indebted, uh, uh, highly indebted countries? All those terminologies form a part of the uh, geopolitical, you know, uh, language or apparatus that we are talking about. When a nation calls another nation a rogue nation, that simple word, rogue being used in here, comes with a lot of connotation. When a nation stands and says, oh, this is our partner or this is our friend and they insist on the long-term relationship that they ever had and the French love to do that. When they talk about, you know, what the multi, according to them, secular relationship that they have with African countries, it means what it means. So geopolitics is also about language and I appreciate the fact that in talking about changing the narrative, you are calling Africa a major player. How many of the people understand that? When it comes to the aspect of a political stability, and uh, how the continent has relied on uh, external powers for a long time. Yes, Clarice, there is also an aspect of uh, geopolitics in, in there. Why? Brother Elijah, earlier in the show, talked about uh, the dictatorship that have been backed or have been backed by superpowers. I'm trying to reverse the narrative in and here. What was this that, you know, what the uh, African dictators thought they were gaining from receiving or welcoming the backing of these European powers is for them to stay in power very for a long time, number one. Number two, there's another aspect of uh, geopolitics that played on the continent with these detectors. It is uh, the use of one ethnic group against the other or the use of uh, one group against the other. Let's take the particular example of uh, Cameroon. I did engage with some uh, friends, you know, uh, and colleagues on that when 
describing the uh, political violence in, uh, the, in, uh, in Cameroon, they referred to a group of people as the Anglophone against the Francophone. I took offense at that. Why? Why do we have Anglophone versus Francophone? I caution people. And my submission is we cannot, speaking about new narrative in geopolitics, use those terminologies. I am from the Ivory Coast. My ethnic group is closer to the Akan people, I mean, belong to the Akan people in Cote d'Ivoire, and closer to the Ashanti people and some groups in Ghana. But yet some Ghanaians will look at me and say the Francophone guy, and I will look at them and say the Anglophone. No. What about our natural or our cultural languages, our native uh, uh, mother tongues that we have that and the cultures that are closer together. So there is no Anglophone, there is no uh, uh, thing, they are Africans. Or at best, there's a Bulu versus another person here. And I want to address uh, very quickly some of the things that I've heard earlier. Uh, that would be my way of uh, a contribution to how the uh, continent can actually take advantage of what is happening uh, currently. That is, we talked about the population. I told you earlier, talking about geopolitics, we have to look at geography. And when we look at geography, we also want to look at the human geography. The continent has a population. We are not overpopulated, the continent has. Still. But if today we have this major competition going on in the world, and as we witness, one of the reasons is the human potential that the continent has. In a few years, 40% of people ages 0 to 25 will be living in Africa. That's a workforce which is currently being depleted either in North America in many European countries. When you have a country such as Canada or in Quebec that goes around the world promoting professional, I'll call it quote-unquote professional immigration, looking for people to immigrate to that country with skills to work is because they understand that the number one productive force in an economy is human beings. Artificial intelligence can do whatever they want to do, but still people need to be behind the machines to program them or to make them work. It is people. But what are we doing with the people, with the workers on the continent? If we wanted to take advantage and benefit from this geopolitical competition. When Chinese signs agreements with the foreign di uh, direct investments and they bring their own workers, what is the impact of that on our African workers and population? The treaties that they sign, the exploitation, and the uh, companies that establish themselves, how do they treat the African workers? If we talk about economic development, then we want to measure that on how well Citizens, workers, families are living better lives. What is the revenue level? Another thing is health. How do we want to take advantage of that? Prepare our populations to take advantage of what is going on right now. COVID-19 came, but before COVID-19, we have Ebola. We have many other crises that you know came in, in there. But yet, when COVID came, that's when we heard that the African CDC, led by actually one of our Dr. Nkenga Song, I believe, from Cameroon, talking about how now Africa should be at the forefront of producing its own medicine. This is a long shot. This is a way overdue. Because security-wise, we cannot continue to rely on the outside world, either the Western world or India or other partners to supply the essential amount of medicine that we need. It is impossible. So health is another thing. I know that for the West African countries, in 2001, all of the members of the ECHO was committed to invest at least 15% of the budgets to improve the health infrastructures in their countries. From 2001 till today, None of those countries have been able to reach that or even to uh, 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 stand to uh, their promises. Mm -hmm. If we do therefore want to take advantage of that, there's another thing we want to look at, security and armies. I usually say that, you know what, no African countries have a good capacity, a, a good fire capacity. How do we therefore compete 
with the superpowers that not only control the uh, international institutions, the UN, where decisions are being made. How do we explode that to make sure that you know there is a democratic process in and there when it comes to making decisions that affect how conflicts are resolved in the world? And those conflicts, you know, were impacting therefore the economy. When we look at what is happening in the Sahel today, Burkina Faso and Mali, we are talking about uh, 2.5 million of people at least that have been removed from the dwelling places, from their working places. What is the impact of that on the economy? Less of production. It is amazing that today, no matter what we are saying, that African leaders can travel to Russia to claim and to beg for grains to be released when we have on the continent all this vast amount of land that we can take care of and produce and be at least food secure or food sufficient. Last point I want to make on that question. In order for us to claim that, the South-South cooperation, South-South cooperation, India has been the great friends. We all remember in 1955 what happened at the Bandung Conference when coming out of a colonization, all of those nations of the world that you know, were witness, experienced you know, were European colonization decided to create what we know as a non-alignment movement. It has evolved up to the group of 77 uh, and now we talk about you know what the south south you know what cooperation in there those things need to be reactivated because i believe with that and the help of the BRICS, it can really position the african continent to kind of escape if you want the uh, dictatorship of those international or global institutions that we have today i am mentioning the un I am talking about the IMF, I'm talking about the World Bank, I'm talking about many others, and even the BRICS. My brother Elijah is right. It is not because we say we have the BRICS that you know, automatically it is going to trans uh, 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 translate into Africa harnessing again, and I love this word that people are using, right? Harnessing the potential of what geopolitics is presenting with us today, not only locally, regionally, but also at the global level. We cannot do that if we continue to have a weak currencies or sometimes currencies that are controlled, produced, given to us. Recently, I was in Nigeria. Clarice, don't be mad. I was just next door to you. Yeah. Uh, next time, well, you know, I will visit you know, Cameroon. Okay. But I was in Nigeria, and some of my colleagues, Professor Elijah, were stunned when I told them that the French CFA is uh, still in, uh, 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 printed in France, and with all of the mechanism that surrounds that, people can believe we are in 2023. So unless we kind of do, there are many other things that we can talk about, our, the stability of our political institutions, and et cetera, et cetera. But I think these are some of the things that I want to say that uh, Africa needs to be uh, aware of, work on, so that you know, we can truly take advantage of uh, this uh, uh, geopolitical changes that you know, what we are seeing uh, in the world today. Very imperative, uh, Dr. Eddie Eric, and of course, a great insider on how we can change the narratives. Of course, I'll always say that Africa is the major player in everything that is happening. Why? Because Africa has the market, Africa has the resources, and Africa has the human capital, a lot that the world needs. And of course, with all of the endowment, what is actually impeding uh, the continent uh, from evolving and of course uh, it is a moment uh, of a wind of change that is growing across Africa and of course uh, with uh, uh, giving African perspectives uh, on a, a debate program like this and others uh, elsewhere it's uh, going to go a long way to change of course the dynamics to change the narratives and uh, before you know it Africa will be taking of course uh, and be very intentional when it comes to making decisions and engaging more uh, with uh, international partners be it 
across Africa and uh, beyond. Uh, and of course, uh, just a reminder, just who are just tuning in, that this is the Pan African debate on African media uh, television. And today we are analyzing uh, geopolitics because it is what is actually uh, uh, making headline news across the global world in present society. We're looking at how Africa, being a major player, can take advantage of these uh, available uh, uh, opportunities uh, that present uh, themselves as a result of uh, multiple engagements with uh, world pairs or world other nations to actually fast track and meet uh, the developmental agendas of the continent Africa. It's not, of course, like uh, some panelists will always say, it's not in 2063 that the African Union will start looking at how they can actually uh, materialize uh, the agenda, but now the the work starts now and take it advantage of what is happening it's already a milestone towards uh, uh, solving some of the internal problems faced by the continent Africa so you are what must welcome uh, to the uh, pan-african television Africa media and we continue in the same perspective with uh, professor Nubang now we we are looking at the economy of Africa we are looking at geopolitics and uh, uh, its inf uh, influence or impact on African economy. Now, the question is, to what extent, uh, Professor Nobong, uh, does geopolitical rivalry in Africa contribute to trade imbalance and uh, the protectionist measures across Africa? Wow, that's a very, very uh, tall one. To what extent do geopolitical influences contribute to trade imbalances and protectionist tendencies on the continent? Well, I think that classical trade analysis would get us to understand that trade in Africa is, is very peculiar in, 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 so many, in so many respects. Uh, of course, the reality is not spread, is not unique across the continent. Uh, but there's one common characteristic that is shared largely across sub-Saharan Africa is the fact that trade is largely natural resource-based. Uh, even a country as advanced as South Africa has uh, natural resources as a significant component of its, of its trade uh, uh, basket. Um, in other parts of the, of the continent, um, it's still hugely natural resources. So either your traditional oil, oil exportation or your colonial era, uh, Korean era uh, cash uh, crops uh, feeding the metropole kind of basket of trade. And, 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 and the composition of trade across African countries has not changed enormously, you know, over the last four or five decades. Uh, there are very few countries on the continent that have really succeeded to diversify and particularly break into uh, trading of, of, of manufacturing products. Um, you have manufacturing hubs here and there across the continent in Southern Africa and South Africa, in Egypt and in some North African countries, Nigeria to a certain extent. Um, but, but these are not globally competitive players in, in, in terms of gaining access to global share of, of, of manufactured products. And to the extent that you are looking at uh, the, the trade being predominated by primary resources and natural resources, and natural products and agricultural products on the continent. These are not really uh, commodities that tend to be influenced by, by geopolitics. Uh, market access is determined by, by, by the, 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 the market holders uh, in the north. Uh, there's a certain extent to which uh, market access is also facilitated by bilateral and multilateral agreements. So your, your economic partnership agreements, EPS with the European Union, your AGOA, uh, with the U.S. and such such uh, strategic partnerships that uh, sometimes have security, trade, uh, and economics all wrapped up into into such arrangements. So, African countries are not really protectionists in in, in the in the classical sense of the word, uh, because they are largely exporters of primary products and largely consumers of manufactured products. Uh, and the only extent to which there will be variations in trade would be affected by the extent to which they have established 
uh, free trade agreements and and, 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 and common custom unions and and, 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 and common areas. So yeah, they are, they are bilateral and uh, uh, multilateral engagements with specific trading blocks like the European Union and and, uh, uh, and and the US and to a certain extent the bilaterals they have with China. Uh, so so the short version of my response to you would be because of the nature of the products which we currently trade largely. Uh, and because of the nature of the kind of interaction between Africa and its strategic partners, those things get regulated already within those arrangements. So when the Re European Union sets uh, economic partnership agreements with most African countries, it influences access to European Union markets. Um, so apart from the ones that are, 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 are set with people like the European Union, you do have bilateral arrangements between specific countries. The one aspect which I haven't yet touched on, which I think is very important for where we are going to, is the extent to which we have intra-African trade. Uh, and, 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 and classical integration literature makes us understand that that's very critical, even for things like the Africa, the continental future area that we are seeking to pursue. And I think that therein lies another huge opportunity that we need to take advantage of. Uh, because to a certain extent, there's a sense in which greater inter-African trade and trade among African countries is going to promote and deepen integration. Uh, it's going to also broaden not just economic integration, but even political integration. Because as we classically say in, 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 in trade economics, even though we talk about trade uh, happening between countries, it's actually businesses that do interact with each other in terms of goods and services and uh, moving across boundaries. And, and people. So there's the whole debate that has to come with the continental free trade area about facilitating movements of goods uh, and services across boundaries, and the whole debate of movements uh, uh, of, of peoples that we are seeing in an increasing measure happening at the sub regional level. So your SEMAC, your SADEC, your ECOWAS are facilitating movements of people um, and goods to a fairly large extent. So the continent has made a lot of progress in that area, but there's still a lot that needs to be done. You know, the whole advent of the African Union passport, the whole advent of free movement. And we are seeing that there's progress in that regard in a number of countries, you know, like, like Ghana and Rwanda and uh, an increasing number of countries like Kenya. And I think Cameroon recently are either switching to the e-visa uh, access for African passport holders, uh, uh, visa online or visa at the border or no visa at all. So, so there's a sense in which, as far as the facilitation of movements of people across boundaries, uh, to ultimately deepen trade and deeper integration, that is already happening. Where the lacune, the missing piece, where which we which which I think is critical for where we need to go to, has to do with our contribution to global production value chains, our contribution uh, in ter relative percentage terms to global trade. Uh, contributions in relative percentage terms to attracting global foreign direct investment, which are all uh, critical components that are indicative of a growing and a healthy economy. Uh, and I think that as far as that is concerned, we are still very, very, very uh, many, many years, uh, uh, light years behind, because uh, it speaks to questions of beneficiation of min minerals, value addition in production, so that we do not just, uh, in a classical case, you know, in the case of Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, the Cote d'Ivoire and the Galaxy War when it comes to issues of cocoa, is being able to tap into the global production value chain of chocolate, for example, you know, and, and that is where there's accrual and accumulation of value. Where, and I think that the Ghanaian government for the last I listened is making progress in that in that regard. And we should have more of such conversations that runs across the continent, not just for the exportation of cocoa or coffee, but when it comes to minerals, you know, your diamonds and all the things that your cobalt, your nickel and all the things that go into the production uh, uh, value chain in, in, in the manufacturing centers of the world. But for that to happen again, brings back to my earlier point of development of human capacity. This was my earlier point of development of uh, technological capabilities, because it's one thing to say you want to beneficiate, it wants to say you want to add value, it wants you to say you want to participate in an industrial process. It's a completely different thing to have the capacity to do so. Now, the advantage that advanced countries have over us, and the one lesson that we can learn from the experience of the Chinas and the Indians of the world, and I think China in this particular instance to Africa represents a practical case. And, and, and the new industrialized Asian countries, your South Koreas of the world and your Singapore's of the world, are our textbook examples of the fact that in 30, 40 years, in three to four decades, you can convert what was elsewhere considered a traditional agricultural economies to become an advanced modern 
uh, economy that is globally competitive. And I think that South Korea is the one example that really embodies that example, so uh, uh, that defends that case. You know, where it has come from a pure agrarian uh, economy in the 60s, 50s and 60s, to being a, a global leader in producing a globally competitive brand like Samsung, uh, being competitive in the autom auto automobile industry. And so Africa then has that opportunity to ask itself the question, you know, China and South Korea make Africa to understand that it's possible. And it's possible within 20, 30, 40 years. If you identify the levers of change, what is it that you need to do? What do these countries do that we need to do in order to develop the capability to become globally competitive? And technology in its nature, it's progressive. So we have not seen the end of innovation. And so there is still there, there are there are rooms, there's room for a lot of uh, for Africa to catch up and to leapfrog and to be to, to, to push itself onto the forefront. But for us to get there, there are lots of basics. There's still, we're still struggling with existential survival issues. You know, people are still dying in our hospitals from preventable diseases. Uh, in my beloved country, Cameroon, there is there is a highway between uh, two major cities that is killing more people in peace time than certain countries have in certain conflict. And this is just blows my mind. For the life of me, I do not understand why we do not have a three to four lane highway between Douala and Yaoundé, and why it is taking us ten years to construct such a highway. So, so, so we can talk and be very optimistic about the future of Africa, but there are some low-hanging practical issues that would unlock the potential that is resting on the continent. And, and, and these are issues with institutions. These are issues just people being able to look, uh, um, putting in place governance institutions, governance mechanisms that says opportunities created, uh, people's uh, 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 capabilities are enhanced, and we clear the foundations for the for the ingenuity for the innovation for the intelligence the smartness that africans possess to be unleashed right now we are still busy with bread and butter issues we are still trying to get people elected into office that are going to feel that they are accountable to the people we're still trying to get people to take budgets from state treasury and execute them accountably you know we have a mixed traditional modern form of government in most of our african countries of people who are not yet thinking in terms of technological uh, cutting edge for the industrial revolution. You know, we had a story of our, one of our beloved ministers recently that went and brought us uh, laptops from China. Uh, which laptops uh, uh, our engineer uh, graduates in Polytech in Yaoundé, given the right resources, could manufacture those things on the, on, on the spot. So, so, so when, when you have these kinds of inefficiencies built into the system, then you see that politics and on the development and perhaps mindset issues comes to act as barriers from us unleashing the potentials that we have. But as far as the world and our place in the world, it's open, it's available for us for the taking. Are we going to do what we need to do at our level in order to unleash our potential? I think for me, that's where the questions lie, to, un un to unlock the potential at the low, low hanging fruit by just creating a culture of excellence. You know getting our, our secondary school students and our university students to believe that hard work pays, you know, that you're not supposed to be related to the media in order to be, ex to be able to successful in life, uh, to be able to have people that are ingenious, that are creative, that are, are, are innovative, that, that we have a culture that encourages innovation by placing a premium and a value on it. Right now, we have a culture that encourages people to become uh, political entrepreneurs. Uh, that, that know how to use uh, public uh, procurement process to enrich themselves. That has to change if we're going to take advantage of the opportunities that, uh, that we have uh, as a continent, as a whole. And I think it's a very shared experience across the continent. Indeed, uh, Professor Nobong, uh, the, the goal is to see how uh, stakeholders uh, can be more pragmatic and intentional uh, when uh, actually unlocking uh, the uh, uh, available opportunities and uh, using it for the benefit of them, for the benefit of the continent Africa. Let's continue the debate Thank with you, you um, um, Mr. Elijah Enwaku. You've been very critical in your analysis, and of course, uh, and uh, Professor Nubong just highlighted uh, the the mindset issue, uh, which actually aligns with uh, the question uh, which I wanted to direct to you after his analysis. We are looking at how competitive 
politics, which is largely negative in Africa, is derailing African leaders or political stakeholders from using their advantages presented by the geopolitical dynamics across Africa. I will take us back to the Central African uh, Republic uh, some years ago, where we saw a former head of state joining a rebel group to be able to actually counteract uh, uh, President uh, Akash Twadera. And of course, uh, w uh, information actually brought to us uh, that uh, this uh, former head of state was being backed by uh, a foreign nation. And of course, bringing us now to, the, to this question of how uh, geopolitical uh, competition breeds discord among discord among uh, African politicians, which actually uh, makes uh, the continent very vulnerable with instability and in turn slowing uh, uh, economic development. So how can we analyze uh, this aspect of uh, uh, competitive politics, which is not healthy for the African continent uh, in the context of geopolitical uh, 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 dynamics in present society? Sorry, my mic was muted there. The question you asked ties in what the economy aspect as well. And as, as a development expert, I want to bring the nitty gritty of what it means to the African continent here for my discussion. Because when we look at you know some of the things that are happening in Africa, whether you are talking about stability, you're talking about economics, you're talking about development, you're talking about technology, you're talking about uh, partnership, you're talking about currency, you're talking about primary product, like my colleague, uh, Professor Nobet uh, Nubong mentioned there, or what uh, my colleague there, Dr. Edi, mentioned, it boils down to what are your priorities? That's what we have failed all along in Africa, Clarice. And I want to mention here, so that those who are listening to us understand, because number one, if you look at the partnership that Africa signs with foreign powers, you will realize that Africa does not know its priorities. You have a country that is hugely, enormously blessed with agricultural potential, natural resources. But what are their first engagement with the foreign powers when they want to go into any agreement? You're going to see that country go into weapons contracts. You're going to see them go into some nonsensical agreements with foreign powers that do not meet their priorities. What are your priorities, African continent, uh, African countries? What do you have? You have huge potential in the agricultural sector. If I was to be an African president today, and I have Russia, I have United States, I have China coming to the table, I say, good and fine. We are going to exchange technology. We are going to exchange human knowledge. You come with what you have, I have agriculture, I have my people that we can feed the whole world if the economic, I mean, uh, the agricultural prowess of Africa are harnessed. Give us the tools, give us the technology. Let's exchange. You're going to exploit our resources. Yes, we do not have the technological manpower, know-how and the equipment, you know, to drill 1,000 meters on the, on, on the ground to exploit that mineral. You have it. Bring it, we're going to let you explore that. But on the same platform, bring the technology that we can use to do what? We have the, tech, the manpower, we have the people that we can exploit our land, we can exploit agriculture, like uh, my colleague, Professor, uh, Dr. Edi mentioned, in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, all these countries that are producing cocoa, do we have the agriculture technology that can you know, boost our production? The West has it. But is that what we are focusing on? No, we are focusing on signing uh, security contracts, buying weapons, buying things that do not meet our interests. You need, when you have a development plan, a development agenda, you have your interests right there at the front. Number two, look at the currency in Africa. To be honest with you, you live from Cameroon and you jump to Nigeria, you have Naira. You jump from Nigeria, you're going to Kenya, you have shillings. You go, jump from Kenya, you go to Zambia, you, you have Kwasha. You jump from Kenya, you will have this joint tech for a, a, a currency policy in Africa. And the issues when it comes to 
currency exchange or whatnot. They all use, you know, if you go to the international scene, they all use the dollar. When they're doing the exchange, you have to exchange from one currency to dollar and then from dollar to your own currency. That alone is a colossal loss for the continent of Africa. If the African continent was to have one single currency that it can trade in, the impact on that alone, I don't know why they don't think about things like this. The impact on that on the continent of Africa alone is going to be colossal. So we do not have priorities that meet our own needs. Therefore, all these foreign powers, when they come in, they're going to suggest things that meet their needs. They're going to go in into, you know, trades on their own terms. And those that creates, you know, some of the imbalances, like you asked my colleague there, those some of the imbalances that we find in Africa, dependency on primary goods that you mentioned about. But what did this for come? When they come, that's the only sector they want to work on. When they come, they look at you look at infrastructure, for example. If you are an African president, it doesn't take, it's not rocket science to understand that. We do not have farm to market roads. For instance, you're going to produce and mass. How do you get this into the market? But these foreign powers will come. They'll exploit our timber. They'll use all the dead roads that we have, send it all over abroad here. There is no way that the African uh, agriculturalist is going to use the same road to, ex to transport all the goods that he's producing from the hills and the forest and all whatnot. This is not farm to market roads. So, in terms of our priorities, Africa needs to understand what our priorities are so that we can play on the global front and say, this is our term. This is our strong point. You know, when you're going for a fight with somebody, you know where your weak point are. You protect your weak point. And you know where your strength are. You're going to punch hard where your strength are because you know that's where you're going to hit hard and you're going to defeat your opponent. But if you go on the table and you allow your opponent to manipulate your weak point to their advantage, you are already working on a disadvantage point. And that's the problem we're having in Africa. And in terms of foreign powers coming to create you know, chaos in Africa and weaken us, we allow that to happen, Clarice. We allow that to happen because we know when it comes to geopolitics, they always say, you know, diplomacy 101, they are not permanent enemies or permanent friends. They are only permanent interest. They come in with their own interests. That's what they're out for. And there's nothing wrong with that. We need to play the game. We cannot allow them to come in. They have their interests, and that's what we want to protect. We allow them to play on us, have their interests being executed, and then what our own priorities are, we do not work on them. That is what our problems are. You met the case of Central African Republic, for example. Clarice, I read a research paper, and the chaos that is going on in that country. It would take us like 10 shows to really discuss the chaos that is going on in that country. Foreign powers have come into the country with their own interests, and everybody is manipulating tribal warlords, tribal leaders, to fight against one another because they want to exploit the resource in that country. There is absolute chaos going on in that country. How does that happen? Because of the internal weaknesses that exist in our own countries, the foreign powers come in, exploit those weaknesses to their advantage, and it's a, and it's a global game. We blame them, but we allow that to happen upon ourselves, Clarice. We allow that to happen. That's why you find this political instability, conflicts all over the place that disrupt even flow and economic development on the continent of Africa. And that means that we do not know what we want. We talked, you know, my colleague talked recently about regional and, and continental free trade. We understand that it takes, it's easy for somebody to leave Ivory Coast and go to France than for somebody to get a visa from Ivory Coast to come to Cameroon. Why do we allow that to happen among ourselves? We cannot trade among ourselves, but we are trading with foreign partners. As you know, I've mentioned this on this show some time ago, intra-country trade within Africa is less than 2%. Intra-country trade within the African country themselves is less than 2%. Imagine that the potential that we have in Nigeria are harnessed in Africa. And the potential that we have in Ivory Coast are harnessed in Cameroon. The potential that we have in Cameroon are harnessed in Democratic Republic of Congo. Why would you need France? Why would you need the United States? Why would you need Canada? Why would you need all this country? Because they come in and exploit us. We do not know what we have. We cannot trade among ourselves. And therefore, these foreign powers, I can go on and on and on. We have talked on, the, on your show here about why is Africa not having a single uh, payment system? You know, in one of the programs that we're, 
were not able to have because of technology. Africa does not have a single payment system. That's just trying to establish one. You have to go through a secondary uh, 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 currency in order to go from Naira to CFP. You have to go through dollar. And all those exchanging means a lot on the continent of Africa. Not only that, it means a lot of trade fluctuations because when that currency fluctuates, it also means fluctuation in the economy of those African countries that are involved in those trades. So therefore, it is not a good thing for the African continent when we do not have our own priorities. We need to have our priorities settled. Where are our strong points? And then we can go to the negotiating table and say, okay, we need help in this area. We need help in this area. But we can help you. We can help the world with agricultural products. We can help the world with energy because the amount of energy, we're not just talking about oil and gas in Africa. We're talking about energy resources like dam and water resources and all what the amount that Africa possesses. We can generate electricity to the rest of Europe. We can do that. But are we harnessing our strong point or we are working on our weaknesses? That is where Af Africa is. We need to reorientate our priorities in terms of development strategies before we go to the negotiating table. Then the Western world and all the geopolitical partners will respect all that we know our strength. It is imperative uh, to know our strength eh, and also know how to engage uh, with our partners, uh, be it among African countries or international partners. Uh, like uh, the African Union Commission chair highlighted some years ago, Africans uh, or African leaders are already conversant of, of the uh, aspect of multilateralism, which is uh, increasing every day across Africa. So it's time for Africa to actually uh, prepare well and see how they can uh, opt the game as far as uh, international negotiations are concerned. Uh, and now talking about uh, uh, bringing Africa together to be able to, to face or to engage properly and uh, positively with uh, international partners, we want to ask uh, this uh, question uh, on how, looking at how these, like you mentioned, Mr. Elijah Inrako, that the internal weaknesses are actually impeding Africans from excelling well. So now, looking at how we can uh, solidify uh, these weaknesses, the question directing, uh, I'm directing to you, uh, Dr. Eddie Eric, is how can African uh, governments effectively navigate uh, and uh, leverage political or geopolitical interest uh, to maximize their economic potential? Number one, willingness. Willingness. And uh, for the sake of, of for the, uh, I mean, for fearing of uh, being repetitive in here, uh, there are elements in uh, the previous, you know, uh, speaker, uh, brother Elijah, you know, uh, uh, comments earlier that, you know, will speak into what you just said. But I believe that, you know, work, uh, Clarice, the first thing is willingness. Why do we say that? When you have uh, some head of states that are outspoken, that are clear, that are very brutal in the ways in which they address the current status of the relationship between the African countries and the Western world, or even the Eastern world with China or any other you know, partners, you do have others who are calling you know, for caution. We can take the example of the debate about the reform of the United Nations. When years ago, the powerful Egyptian uh, UN Secretary General, Boutros Boutros Ghali, who is accredited with the reform of the United Nations, you know, uh, a peacekeeping uh, a mission. When that debate came to the table about whether an African country should be given the seats at the Security Council to be making decisions that impacts world relations, you have dissensions about which one of the African countries should be at that table. We remember the competition, you know, where countries such as Nigeria, South Africa, you know, were named in and there uh, as well. My point is there was no such a unity uh, in and there, no such a willingness and stronger power from uh, those uh, African heads of state to go there. And the lack of willingness, you know, uh, Clarice, also boils down to, again, the... Uh, uh, I mean, it's the reflection of the consequences of uh, this long-term 
relationship that, you know, were a geopolitical relationship that, you know, Africa has had. When you have a head of states, you have a politicians, you have a members of parliaments, you have a stakeholders in some countries that say, for instance, looking at France, that the relations between the France and Cote d'Ivoire, France and uh, Cameroon or other countries are just relationship between them, human beings and water. It means what it means. In other words, those people are saying that there is no way we can change or sever or move away from that relationship. But no way. Nobody has ever called for a complete cessation, rupture of relationship with friends. We are talking about the reinvention, the reaffirmation, the redimensionalization, whatever it is, of those relationships in such a way that it benefits you know, Africa's economic growth. They said economic growth should be measured, not in terms of the GDP, because many countries today, are fooling us actually with this question of GDPs. Number two, many governments in Africa today are fooling us, fooling their population with the so-called ranking sometimes that they come up with. The true question that we need to ask ourselves, and we are charging African citizens, workers, wherever you are, is to ask people to what extent the GDP that you are talking about this year is reflecting on my daily life in my ability to have access to hospital, to have access to affordable, good quality health care, to my ability to work and be paid, to have access to employment, or to have access to loans that will allow me to start a business, for instance, or, you know, something in the informal sector. Let us know that the informal sector, the agricultural sector per se in Africa, does employ a lot more people than what we call, you know, what the formal sector. So you have that dimension uh, 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 in, in there, number one, of uh, this uh, willingness. Number two, uh, Clarice, internally, the earlier question that you asked, you know, what my brother Elijah was about, you know, what, how competitive politics impede Africa's, you know, uh, ability. It is true. We got to look at this. And this way, I'm just not talking about the uh, African leaders, but I'm talking about all stakeholders. When you look at uh, the uh, instability, chronic instability within our countries, as we talked about uh, two days ago or three, Niger went into another coup. And when you analyze, and if we sit down to analyze all of the intricacies or the intersections of this uh, new coup, you will see and understand that uh, to the table, there will be a question of security, number one, but there will also be the question of the redistribution of the revenues coming from the natural resources, uranium particularly, that is being exploited in and there. There is another level of the competition as well, is for the ability of these uh, head of states, the stakeholders, to really think about, think outside of the box and think about how to change Again, we said the narrative of the relationship that they have with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the European countries. The uh, treaties that have been signed since the 1960s, the so-called years of independence, I uh, will charge our viewers and watchers with the power of the internet today to go do some research. And you will find how grotesque it was for friends, for instance, to say in some of these uh, defense and uh, uh, agreements, for instance, or development cooperation agreement, whatever you, 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 you term it, les accords de défense et de, 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 de coopération, you have uh, some terms in those uh, treaties saying that natural resources that were discovered at the time of the signature and those that will be discovered in the future should be in the purview of friends first before anything else. For some of the countries, since we talk about you know, what currency, it is again the time maybe to blow the horn for many of those African countries that continue to use the French CFA to have a bold leadership that engage the topic on the table. Another thing that you know what African countries can do, as we talk about you know, we're harnessing the uh, human potential, there is no way people can continue to be outside of decision making. When it comes to elections, how many people do turn out to vote? 
in respective countries, regardless of the effort that's being made. When it comes to participating, giving an opinion about you know, what public service delivery, because that's how we can also measure economic development. How many citizens participate in those debates? I believe we will start doing that more and more, empowering the civil society, having more channels like African media, independent, that are listened to with some uh, different uh, uh, view and viewers, I believe that this will also put some sort of a pressure on the current leadership. There is uh, a very slow tectonic you know, change that you know, what we are witnessing with what is happening. New young leaders, they are not necessarily head of states, but wherever they are, we can see them voicing. When you have a young people in Niger, in many other countries, blocking UN, uh, United Nations, you know, peacekeeping troops. It is not because they don't want peace. It is not because they still wanted to have a chaos in their countries. It is a way for them to voice their discontent to the fact that years after years, you have those troops on the ground, but still there is no peace. And wherever there is no peace, there is no security. When there is no security, there is no uh, sound economic development and poverty continues. But in the meantime, what happens? You have uh, the development and the multiplication of uh, black market to continue to exploit uh, the natural resources. In Cote d'Ivoire, when the war started a few years ago, the cocoa beans were still growing and they were still harvested. At some point, we have even seen countries such as uh, Burkina Faso being able to export cocoa, but brother Elijah, there is no one cocoa plant in Burkina Faso. This is what comp uh, competition, internal competition or in-country competition can also uh, create as impediments for Africa to really take advantage of what is happening. Clarice, I want to rest on that case in here very quickly by uh, mentioning one thing that you asked earlier. When we look at uh, the uh, competitive politics, Brother Elijah did answer the question looking at uh, internal conflicts. Liberia is there, Sierra Leone, Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali. How even African countries play into that? My country, the Africans, for instance, you know what, in uh, popular language is accused, for instance, of uh, hosting at some point Charles Taylor in Cote d'Ivoire. And we know what Charles Taylor was doing in, uh, 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 in Liberia. But I want to mention another form of competition between the African countries themselves that also border around geopolitics. Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. The two countries, neighboring brothers, had to resolve to the United Nations to resolve a conflict over who possesses a what a uh, 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 oil, you know, uh, 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 resources uh, uh, onshore. Second, you have Nigeria and Cameroon. We remember in the 19, late 1980s, 1990s about the Bakasi Island and then the fight that they have in there. What was the purpose of that? Geopolitical interest in India, Eritrea and Ethiopia, they fight in India. Geopolitical interest, who should have access to the sea? And uh, you have a uh, Morocco and Algeria over the question of uh, the uh, Sahrawi uh, Arab Republic. Till today, to what extent this is uh, preventing, right? Northern Africa, for instance. And then you have also the exclusion of uh, Mauritania or Mauritania deciding to leave the ECOWAS. Here are some uh, uh, forms of competitions as well, which I believe border around uh, the question of geopolitics. But again, at the end of uh, the uh, day, does not position Africa to be stronger. Last example I want to take is a company for which my father worked. It was a prime example, Air Africa. In 1967, I believe, Air Africa was created with a treaty that they called the Treaty of Yaoundé. 10 African countries came together merged their forces to create this company, which was the largest, I mean, the company with the largest airspace in the world. Of course, we have a French interest in that. But later on, what did we find out? Air Africa has disappeared till today. To what extent? Country, internal conflicts, or in com uh, conflict between those uh, member countries in, in there for leadership or for whatever it is, led to the dissolution of Air Africa and the inability to rebuild that company back. Where are we today? Our airspace is also broken apart. So these are some examples, again, that show the extent to which geopolitics, you know, what is playing and how, again, 
as African countries, we have not positioned ourselves to take advantage of all of those things for the sake of economic development and the betterment of the lives of the people on the ground, whether the workers, the women, the children, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you so much. That, uh, Dr. Eddie, uh, we have just two, three minutes to be together. So, uh, conclusively, yeah, from you, uh, Professor uh, Nubong, let's get your concluding statement by answering this question on how African uh, countries can safeguard their economic uh, interests and minimize uh, the negative uh, impacts of uh, geopolitical influence. One minute, please. I think we need to start talking more and more in terms of our strategic interest. I think we need to start articulating um, questions around our place in the world and the things that matter to us and, and how international agreements and our engagement with our bilateral and multilateral partners needs to go directly to uh, serve our interests. So discuss with the European Union around market access to European day to European market for products that Africa has the potential to export. Uh, have conversation with trading partners about uh, growing and, and increasing participation in global production value chains. We do not want to just export cocoa, but we also want a chunk of the chocolate production value chain. And I think that we have to be very uh, clear in identifying where they, 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 we have leverage uh, to grow uh, our influence and grow our participation in global trade and economic processes. And to be very clear about uh, asking uh, uh, and the building capacity to participate in those processes. The classical argument is to start from where we have a, a comparative advantage, which is in the ownership of natural resources. And, and I think that it should be us being able to say that we want to share the cake. We no longer want to just uh, ship, uh, put the raw stones and ship them off. We want to be able to add value so that we can be able to retain value. And, and that has to become part of our our, our conversation as uh, articulation of a strategic interest. I think let me just stop at that for the time uh, uh, allocation that you have given me to give a chance to the other part, part, uh, panelists to be able to contribute. Of course, thank you so much, uh, Professor Gabila Nubong. Uh, one last statement from you, uh, uh, Mr. Elijah Enoko, of course. Uh, I would like that you conclude by actually analyzing on the aspect of the political will, we know that if the African economy has to uh, be buoyant, and if Africa has to uh, take advantage of the geopolitical game, uh, there is need for a strong political will to be able to maximize these opportunities. So what are the stakes for our political leaders and also economic stakeholders across Africa? We need leaders that can take the bull by the horns, just, just as plain as it is. We need leaders that can take the bull by the horns. We need a leader like Paul Kagame that can go to the uh, United Nations Development Index Conference and say, we want to put a policy in place that says, no raw product is leaving Africa as raw product. It must be semi-finished. There's no reason why cocoa cannot be finished, semi-finished in Africa before being sent to Europe. There's no reason why Iron ore cannot be semi-finished in Africa before being sent to Europe. There's no reason why. There's no reason. Africa has the capacity to do semi-finished products. That is where we get killed, because all what Africa could have done is being done in Europe and Western world and so on, and then we lose the economic benefits of that. We need leaders that can take the bull by the horns and call a spade a spade. So when we have leaders like that, I'm telling you the truth. You know, we have people in South Africa like, you know, Julius Malema that I don't really agree with all, everything he says, but if you have political independence without economic independence, you are still colonized. You're still colonized. That's the problem in Africa. So if the political will is there to take the bull by the horns and call a spade a spade in Africa, I'm telling you that the Western world will listen. They will come to the table and know that these guys are not joking anymore. They know their capacity. They, have the, they know their prowess. They know what they are able to deliver. We have to take shape. And they will adjust. I'm telling you, they are adjust. But if we go fragmented and then uh, uh, South Africa is being pulled there by BRICS, and then you have Kenya being pulled by the U.S., you have this one being pulled by France, you have Cote d'Ivoire that is in the pockets of uh, uh, Macron, you have this one and this one, and then we are all disjointed, we are not going to win the game. But if we go with one voice and say, this is what we want, take it or leave it, these guys will act. Okay. And Dita, thank you. 
Mr. Elijah Enoko, just to balance it. Let's end with you. Now, uh, Dr. Eddie Eric, uh, I would like that you end by answering these questions. We have heard all the analysis uh, presented by uh, all the, the, the panel of experts. So the question is, and in your analysis, you made mention uh, of the BRICS being uh, actually an exemplary organization uh, that can come to change things around for Africa, especially as the world is moving towards multipolarism. So now, in your perspective, uh, what can the BRICS offer in uh, uh, especially in line with the financial independence of African states. Clarice, I believe the first thing that the BRICS uh, should offer before even talking about you know what financial states is uh, the ways in which the West has related to Africa. Okay. Everything boils down to one thing: has the worst or does the West consider? Africans as human beings or as people worthy. I live in the United States and we cannot shy away from those things. As long as, as Walter Rodney said, you have a slavery or you have not looking at people as human beings to the same state or as you are, it is the bottom line. If the Brits shy away from that kind of a vision, at least around the table, you will have a people who are not just decorating, but you are people, you have a people who will be truly or uh, and effectively included in decision making. That's, I believe, is one process. Second thing that can be pushed in and there is also the African health states, you know what, that are around those tables. Look at us as equal partners, at least at that level. Second thing. When you talk about the finances, Africa does need a uh, financial assistance. We talk about the BRICS. China is doing something about, you know, what the Belt Road and the quite a number of things. But if we scrutinize very well, Professor Elijah, uh, my brother Elijah, you know, uh, uh, lectured us last time on that. The terms of the loans that China is uh, awarding African countries or some countries may not be optimum may not be the best thing. We have seen China, for loan purposes or loan reason for lack of repayment, uh, threatening to seize the airports of the country, which is the most uh, uh, grotesque and, uh, and, and the weird thing I've ever seen because an airport is part of the security apparatus and the, the, uh, the sovereignty of the country, the grandeur of the country. For China to threaten to seize that airport, it means what it means. But all that tied down to, again, the type of uh, uh, cooperation or treatment uh, treat, uh, treaties that, that were signed in there. So the BRICS should also shy away uh, from that one. And then the last thing, listen, one of the things that is also killing in terms of uh, foreign direct uh, investment or any other, let's look at the illicit financial flows. Here's one thing that you know what the uh, BRICS maybe can also pay attention to. And then finally, is to look at uh, what uh, my brother Elijah called earlier, the priorities. I will replace the word priorities with interests. Sometimes Africans, we are afraid of using that word. And I'm not talking about, you know, Elijah, but, you know, uh, our watchers. We need to be selfish. The problem with Africans, we are not selfish. We are too good. And as people say in French, you cannot be born one time, uh, two times. If you are born one time is enough. If you are born two times, you become bonbon. And if uh, Elijah understands what bonbon is, bonbon means uh, sweeties. And people will suck it to their advantage. We need to be a little bit selfish. Not among ourselves to uh, preserve power or to capture state power, but we need to be selfish to put the interest of Africa on the table first and foremost before anything. This is what should be done around the BRICS table, and I believe it will bring what you have called, uh, Clarissa, the change of narrative. Okay. The change of narrative. The change of narrative, because geopolitics is also language. Sure. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. A.D. Eric, for the great insight. I want to appreciate uh, you all for your analysis uh, on our topic for discussion this day, while also acknowledging uh, the uh, uh, technicians for ensuring that this uh, debate program was worth it. We cannot also go without appreciating uh, viewers out there. Keep trusting Afric Media, and of course, uh, news is always on the move. I want to leave you now, but of course, I wish you a splendid moment in the company of transmissions on Afric Media Television. Do have a lovely weekend and see you some other time.